Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deb Klenotic, Deputy Communications Director at the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection here in Harrisburg. Today, we're going to hear from Environmental Protection Secretary Patrick McDonnell, DEP Environmental Justice Director Allison Acevedo, Transportation Secretary Yasmin Gramian, Agriculture Secretary Russell Redding, and Conservation and Natural Resources Secretary Cindy Adams Dunn. He'll talk about Pennsylvania Climate Action Plan 2021. At the conclusion of the remarks, we'll take questions from reporters through Zoom. And now we'll start with Secretary McDonald. Thank you very much, Deb, and, and uh, thank you to my colleagues, uh, the reporters and, and other viewers for, for your interest in, and concern around uh, the climate crisis and, and what Pennsylvania is doing about it. Um, Pennsylvania since 1900 has uh, seen a temperature increase of nearly two degrees Fahrenheit. That is increasing the intensity of weather events uh, from this month's historic flooding and tornadoes in southeastern counties uh, to record water levels in Lake Erie in 2019 uh, and to flooding that led to U.S. Department of Agriculture disaster declarations in 2018. Uh, to be proactive on climate change, uh, we need to do two things. Uh, we need to significantly lower greenhouse gas emissions to uh, pre prevent the worst impacts and adapt to the level of impacts we are already ex experiencing. As Governor Wolf has said, we must move now out of reactive mode on climate change. That challenge can seem overwhelming. So where do we start? Well, the Pennsylvania Climate Action Plan 2021 uh, gives us that starting point. Uh, in 2019, Governor Wolf set Pennsylvania's first ever goals for greenhouse gas emissions, a 26% reduction by 2025 uh, and an 80% reduction by 2050 compared to 2005 levels. We have made some progress. As of 2017, the last uh, year that we had emission data available uh, for the Climate Action Plan, emissions were nearly 19% lower than they were in 2005. Uh, but we need to lower emissions more and faster. Uh, there are 18 actions that will meet our greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. As long as partners across sectors start now to carry them out within five years, within 10 years and beyond. We'll get our biggest greenhouse gas uh, uh, emission reductions from creating a carbon-free electricity grid that uses renewable and nuclear energy. The next biggest emission reduction will come from increasing industrial energy efficiency and transitioning industrial process heating away from fossil fuels. And our third biggest emission cut will come from getting more electric cars and trucks on the road. We can do this in five to 10 years, again, if we start now. We can also increase carbon capture and sequestration by reforesting locations like marginal croplands or, or abandoned mine lands. Uh, if we do not step up, not only will we not reach our goal of lowering emissions, but the Pennsylvania of 2050 will be generating 1.4% more emissions than in 2005. That's a lot of heat waves and a lot more flooding. We have a considerable challenge ahead of us but there are a number of tools at hand that, we, that can quickly boost our progress. First, we can join 11 other Northeast states in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. This will cut greenhouse gas emissions from power plants from uh, between 97 and 227 million tons by 2030. We can also require commercial buildings to meet higher energy efficiency codes. We can get more electric vehicles on the road by expanding charging infrastructure and making more models available statewide. We can raise the alternative energy portfolio standards to require electricity generators to get more of their energy from clean renewable sources. And we can increase the current energy savings requirement for electric distribution companies and create new similar requirements for gas utilities. There are many other ways to act now to reduce emissions this climate action plan is a framework of both vision and on the ground realities that shows how. But we also need to talk about uh, how we adapt to climate change impacts we're already experiencing. Here are some of the greatest risks we face from climate change. 
the health and safety of all Pennsylvanians, and especially Pennsylvanians who live in environmental justice areas, will be at significant risk from heat waves and flooding. Infrastructure is at greatest risk from flooding and landslides. Farmers are at significant risk from an overall warmer, wetter climate, including flooding. And our recreation and tourism industries, as well as our forests, ecosystems, and wildlife, are at greatest risk from the steady rise in statewide average temperature. This covers a lot of areas of our lives. The Pennsylvania Climate Action Plan 2021 charts an adaptation pathway for each of these areas. My cabinet colleagues will talk further about the challenges they're seeing, actions needed, and efforts underway in infrastructure, agriculture, and natural resources. And I'd like to highlight some of the actions that are needed in our environmental justice areas. As Allison Acevedo will tell you in a moment, Many environmental justice communities have already experienced decades of disinvestment and now also face disproportionate risk from climate change. We need to start now to identify opportunities to meaningfully engage and partner with community-based organizations and residents. Opportunities for community capacity building can be identified and then invested in. Uh, for example, grants can be created for resilience projects such as flood protected community centers with green roofs. When climate risks are integrated into local planning, support for vulnerable residents needs to be included. We need to incorporate informal heat wave coping practices into our emergency planning. Climate change adaptation strategies such as these must be evaluated in terms of the triple bottom line with economic, social, and environmental costs and benefits all considered. The cost of inaction may be severe, and the benefits of any action may be sizable, as small investments can prevent difficult situations from becoming dire. I wanna thank the Energy Program Office here at DEP, our Policy Office, our Environmental Justice Office, as well as our partners, uh, ICF Consulting, Penn State University, and Hamill Environmental Consulting for developing this plan for statewide climate action. I urge leaders in our legislature, our state and local governments, our many business sectors, agriculture, academia, and community and environmental organizations to read the Pennsylvania Climate Action Plan 2021 and see how they fit in and take action now. Thank you, and uh, I'm pleased to turn it over to Allison Acevedo, uh, the Director of our Office of Environmental Justice. Allison. Thank you so much, Secretary McDonald. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allison Acevedo, and I'm the Director of the Office of Environmental Justice at DEP. I'm excited to be here today with Secretary McDonald, Secretary Gramian, Secretary Redding, and Secretary Adams Dunn to unveil Pennsylvania Climate Action Plan 2021, and also importantly, reinforce the urgency of action around climate change. As Secretary McDonald explained, it's vitally, vitally important that we pursue climate action in communities that are particularly susceptible to impacts of climate change. So these are often communities, these susceptible communities are often disproportionately impacted and they're often communities of color and low income um, in low income areas. Having already experienced decades of disinvestment, Pennsylvanians in these communities uh, contend with daily ongoing challenges that are and will continue to be worsened by climate change impacts. Residents in vulnerable communities are often in older housing, older housing infrastructure situations and have limited access to air conditioning and have limited mobility around moving to other locations as heat waves bring more and sequential days of 90 and even 95 degree temperatures. People can experience temperatures in as much as 10 degrees or even 20 degrees higher if living in neighborhoods that are heat islands that have little canopy often and little green space. Increased heat as well as rainfall and flooding, which are climate um, situations exacerbate pre-existing health conditions and further challenge the well-being of residents and communities that have faced continuous environmental and climate challenges. In creating Pennsylvania Action Climate Action Plan 2021, 
DEP and our Office of Environmental Justice really listen to views expressed by partners, uh, in, uh, particularly in environmental justice communities. We held outreach meetings and engagement sessions with groups across Pennsylvania to gather feedback on the 2018 Climate Action Plan, really inform feedback and work with the, and particularly work with organizations, nonprofit organizations and other partners, including the Environmental Advisory Council in Harrisburg, where we worked with that organization to plan a climate town hall. So this 2021 climate plan really incorporates and addresses so many of the issues that were raised at these these engagement sessions. They, this plan was able to take the feedback and offer meaningful meaningful suggestions and solutions around the around the issues raised at the engagement session. This plan actually provides an environmental justice and equity analysis and stresses environmental justice and stresses equity in developing climate action strategies. It charts specific pathways of adaptation to lessen the increase of climate impacts of increased heat and flooding on vulnerable populations and really identifies ways to ensure equity in developing these strategies. The plan also serves critically because we're thinking about educating communities. It serves as a reference guide on climate change and outlines the history of state level climate policies and practices. Pennsylvania Climate Action Plan 2021 is a blueprint for climate action, which embeds environmental justice and equity. And that is critical. We pledge, and this is the collective we on the call, but in, and we collectively pledge to work collaboratively with communities to ensure they're able to use this plan as a tool for their already amazing existing work and to help drive future efforts to increase climate change awareness and education as a foundation for creating equitable climate initiatives at the local level. Equitable initiatives are key. We invite others from other sectors like the nonprofit, legislative, government, business, labor and academic se sectors and other constituencies to join us as we take action on climate change. Thank you and I'll turn it over now to Transfer Transportation Secretary Graham Thank you, Allison. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here today and joining this very important uh, conversation about climate change. Only a few weeks ago, the remnants of Hurricane Ida dumped rain on Pennsylvania for nearly 24 hours, as well as high winds and even tornadoes. Ida resulted in major flooding in many areas, especially in the southeast and south central areas of the state. Heavy rains and extreme weather wreaks havoc on our transportation infrastructure. Over 400 roads were closed at the height of Ida's impacts, including 16 major interstates or expressways. One particularly dramatic example is the Vine Street Expressway in Philadelphia, which flooded with nearly 30 million gallons of water, filling entire roadway and rising up the under decks of the cross bridges as if a river was flowing through the city. It remained closed for several days as multiple agencies worked to remove the water, cleaned up the debris and checked for damages. Over 800 bridges, 800 bridges around the state will need post flood inspections after Ida. We anticipate over $16 million in damage from Hurricane Ida and over 1,200 damage locations. In 2018, which was the wettest year on record for many parts of Pennsylvania, there was nearly $126 million in flood and slide related damage to state maintained roads and bridges, not to mention the financial impacts to the local networks. This is roughly equal to the cost to resurface 125 miles of two-lane interstate and the highest cost in any single year in the past 10 years. Emergencies like these impact budgets, plan projects, and workforce priorities. These are the real-world impacts of a changing climate. Flooding is happening more often and in areas where it may not have in the past. 
Pennsylvania has seen a 10% increase in precipitation over the last 50 years, and we anticipate by 2050, precipitation will be 8% higher than it is now. In 2018, PennDOT finalized an extreme weather vulnerability study, which analyzed past PennDOT flooding-related data, traffic volumes, federal and national weather and flooding resources, and identified roadways susceptible to flooding based on that data. We incorporated the data in the study into our maintenance and planning practices, and we designed projects with longer-term resiliency in mind. Because we know that we are already experiencing the effects of climate change, we need to proactively work to adapt to this new reality. Additionally, transportation is the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Pennsylvania. And while increased fuel efficiency and electrical vehicles becoming more mainstream for personal use, um, personal use has, has helped transportation emissions to decrease over time, the number of trips in Pennsylvania has increased and are projected to continue in this direction. Reducing the number of individual vehicle trips will help, but while public transportation is available in some form in all 67 Pennsylvania counties, in many areas of the state, it's difficult to get around without access to, be, to a vehicle. And Pennsylvanians who are part of a minority group uh, are disproportionately impacted by this. 34% of Black, 22% of Latino, 23% of Native Americans, 14% of Asian Pacific Island, Islanders households in Pennsylvania do not have access to a vehicle as compared to 8% of white Pennsylvania households. Investing in a robust and reliable public transportation system will increase mobility for all Pennsylvanians, as well as addressing traffic congestion. Creating and supporting a safe, sustainable, quality transportation system that works for everyone is at the center of PennDOT's mission, and we are committed to the ongoing work that this requires. Now I'm happy to turn things over to the Secretary of Agriculture, Russell Redding. Secretary Gremian, thank you. Uh, it's good to be with you and my colleagues and a special note of thanks to Secretary McDonald and team for spearheading uh, this report, the assessment that was done previously and the report that we now have in front of us. Thank you uh, to you and your team. Uh, very much appreciated. As we know and as we've heard here again today that climate change is not exclusive. It does not pick uh, and choose who it affects, right? It affects every one of us and underscores the interagency collaboration that you see here today in the report captures. Uh, it also means that we collectively then uh, can be part of that solution. Pennsylvania agriculture has a very intimate relationship with climate, right? We live and die by the climate. We have seen the extremes of uh, weather in, in the last several years, Secretary Gramian's uh, point earlier about just recently the impact of, of heavy rains and flooding. Uh, we've seen those certainly on the fields of Pennsylvania and across our, our farm country. But again, um, it, it is not uh, limited to our rural areas and farms. Everyone in Pennsylvania is impacted. And the other extreme, of course, we have had those. I mean, the droughts, uh, you know, that uh, plague our uh, cities and, and test our production systems and, and our water reserves uh, is another result of uh, extreme climate. But one of the concerns of, of uh, to agriculture is what happens to risk, right? It magnifies the risk. And that risk comes in many forms. Secretary Dunn and I had the pleasure several weeks ago to join the Center for Rural Pennsylvania to talk about invasive species. And what is happening across the state of Pennsylvania, again, is in part attributable to uh, the climate and the climate changes, because as climate increases, uh, the in invasive species uh, introduced to this region and this pathway 
uh, into Pennsylvania in the Northeast uh, is further extended because of climate. The other risk, uh, and it's important, is that the 60% uh, of the human diseases and 75% of the emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. I mean, they, they go back and forth or can go back and forth between humans and animals. Uh, that's simply the diseases and in invasive species. In addition to that, of course, our livestock, your livestock dependent state, uh, and our companion animals, uh, which we know are even more important to us now in a post pandemic, uh, than they, than they were. But the heat stress, uh, experienced by animals can lead to extended health issues, of course. Uh, and in the case of dairy, we know, uh, decreased, uh, yields and, and production. But we can reach this conclusion that this is impossible. This is overwhelming and daunting. I would argue that, uh, you know, to the contrary, is that we collectively uh, actually can do a lot of things. And the action plan captures that. So I'm optimistic about the plan, what it provides. It is a guide, a blueprint, the words you've heard uh, today. It's a comprehensive plan that collectively allows us to mitigate uh, climate change. For agriculture specifically, it notes two important actions. One is to use all of the existing tools and programs and incentives uh, to uh, increase the energy efficiency for agriculture. And secondly, provide uh, you know, trainings and tools to help farmers implement the agricultural best practices, as we call them. Now, these are best practices that are, are part of, of what we do uh, their farmland preservation, and its soil health, its nutrient management, forest stewardship, things that Secretary McDonald and Dunn and I spent a lot of time talking about relative to water quality. They are directly transferable to the challenge of climate, right? So it is a two for uh, where we get the water quality benefits, uh, but we also get the benefit of carbon, carbon sequestration and management. Uh, that is important. Our Bureau of Farmland Preservation in Pennsylvania leads the nation. We just celebrated uh, 600,000 acres being preserved in Pennsylvania um, uh, several weeks ago. In addition to that, we, we have our Pennsylvania Farm Bill. The governor and the General Assembly uh, you know, put Pennsylvania in a great position to do something that not another state in this nation has done, and that's a state-level farm bill. It provides new resources for planning and engagement and best management practices. And we have a state conservation commission in Pennsylvania that the Secretary McDonald and I have the privilege of, of sharing. But the work that they do, the relationships they have at conservation districts with the farm community and many of the stakeholders that the Secretary noted are really important in the effort of mitigation. The Conservation Commission also uh, has some of the resources to the goals and the action items. Working with our REAP tax credit uh, program, which has been highly successful in Pennsylvania, all of these are best management practices as well. And then final point, uh, that is fine. Uh, but one of the things that we know we have to do is to keep building our reservoir of resources. Right, so the governor uh, uh, joined with other governors in the Chesapeake Bay region, and I've joined with my colleagues and other secretaries of agriculture uh, to request the USDA to support the Chesapeake Bay Resilient Farms Initiative. It is about the tools and the resources we need uh, to address the issues of both water quality and of course climate and speak directly to the action plan. We feel the pressures of uh, climate and the changes that are occurring. We feel the pressures of the environment and environmental stewardship. Uh, we feel the pressures of water quality. All of that comes together uh, in this discussion of climate and is exacerbated by the extremes. So uh, thank you for being part of this conversation to my colleagues, uh, for your leadership, but also to all of Pennsylvania. We have an opportunity to change the course of climate and we can do that with the tools that we have and the, the partnership that we have. So thank you. Uh, always a pleasure to be with Secretary Don, my colleague at DCNR, Secretary to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's wonderful to hear the comments from my colleagues and uh, to uh, talk about this important subject and think about uh, the action element of this climate action plan and what it means and the multiple benefits of acting now. 
Uh, in DCNR's world, I'll talk about a few specific things. Um, one is the impact on the forest, the forest ecosystem. Think about the name Pennsylvania. It means Penn's Woods. Forests are our primary ecosystem. We depend on them for our economy. Uh, the forest products industry, the recreation, the ben numerous benefits that come from forests. Forests are stressed by climate change. We're seeing shifts in the range of the species in Pennsylvania and perhaps of specific concern, our state tree, the northern hemlock is uh, threatened by climate change in a couple ways. Number one, it's, it's range. Number two, uh, as Secretary Redding mentioned, invasive species benefit from climate change and the hemlock woolly adalgid is attacking our hemlocks and to save hemlocks in many of our key areas, we've got to actually protect them with a, uh, with a pesticide. And uh, when you have hemlocks in our forested streams, in our uh, mountain streams of Pennsylvania, you have native brook trout. And when you lose hemlocks, and you lose that cooling shade from the hemlock trees, you put at risk uh, the, the trout in that specific watershed. So there's two of our, um, our state species. A third one that's threatened by climate change, the Eastern Hellbender, which recently named the state amphibian, um, is a very specific, it has very specific habitat requirements. And so when you look at species that do okay with climate change versus species that do not, species that have very narrow ranges and specific uh, requirements for food and cover don't do well with climate change. So as you uh, look at a change in climate in Pennsylvania, we'll see a lot of shifts. Some species will do okay, and some will not, and everything will shift uh, northward and upward in elevation. <laughs> that leads to some of the solution-oriented elements, like uh, like all the speakers have said, you know, Secretary Redding, uh, McDonald, uh, Secretary Gramian, and Austin Acevedo. Resolving this now has multiple benefits. When you think about uh, weather-related uh, impacts on humans, the the thing that causes more fatalities than any other weather-related uh, disaster is summer heat. Everyone thinks it's going to be tornadoes and hurricanes and something dramatic like earthquakes. It's actually summertime heat, and it's, and it's often in our heat island areas and the urban communities. And uh, the solution there, one of the major solutions there is regreening these areas. If you can just get 40% uh, shade on those streets and sidewalks from street trees, that will make a huge difference in the uh, the local heat. If you get um, urban parks and shady, cool parks and those heat islands, that'll cool down the street temperatures. I think Allison Acevedo mentioned as much as uh, 20 degrees. I've even heard 22 degrees from a study in uh, Philadelphia. So that that's uh, the good news is there are some solutions at our fingertips that we can act on uh, right now. Uh, the good news also is uh, these solutions can be funded by Reggie. So while reducing carbon uh, through Reggie, you can actually fuel the solutions on the, on the solution side. As Secretary Redding mentioned, the work that, uh, that Patrick, he and I do together in Chesapeake Bay, uh, putting, putting trees by our stream sides not only cools the stream, but it reduces the pollutants that are flowing into our streams and rivers in Chesapeake Bay. Again, multiple benefits, uh, cleans up our water, we all need water, cools down the streams, uh, helps our uh, habitats in the streams and meets your Chesapeake Bay requirements. So again, multiple benefits for acting now. Just switching uh, to recreation briefly, um, impacts on recreation. First of all, uh, you know, flooding and drought has a major impact on water-based recreation. Uh, you can't, you can't uh, paddle and swim in a stream that's flooding, nor can you when there's a trickle of water because of a drought. Um, the damage done by storm events, as you know, Secretary Gramian mentioned, the uh, Hurricane Ida and its dramatic effect in the southeast. Uh, we had, uh, we're tallying up the cost, but Hurricane Ida uh, really did damage to 60 miles of Delaware Canal State Park. Beautiful Delaware Riverside State Park damaged uh, greatly by Hurricane Ida. Damages might be, might be up in the $20 million range to that park. Again, these are important recreation areas for both water and land-based recreation um, damaged by a hurricane. This summer, um, we had a tornado uh, spawned by uh, a rapidly moving weather system hit Laurel Hill State Park. We've seen more and more of these. There were 1,200 people as overnight guests in that park when the tornado hit the park. Thankfully, nobody was hurt, but it destroyed buildings and tore down trees and did a lot of damage to the park. 
in uh, DCNR with 121 state parks. Uh, we, we hosted 46 million visits last year. A lot of people recreating outdoors. And when extreme weather hits, um, they're, they're, they may be in a tent or they may be out in the woods. They may not have the protection that they would have at home. So again, safety, uh, you know, safety, you know, human safety and also damage to the public infrastructure is a, uh, is a big challenge. So again, uh, like others uh, have said, um, you know, the, the, uh, the goal is to act now is the climate action plan that incorporates a comprehensive list of ideas and opportunities. We try to demonstrate some of these ideas at the state parks just early this week. I announced uh, as part of a sustainability tour that we'll be putting Prescott State Park to net zero. We're putting a solar parking canopy at Beach 8. It'll shade the cars, make it nice for the visitors, and bring the whole park to net zero. We already have a small solar array at the Tom Ridge Center that brings the education wing down uh, to net zero. So again, improving the park, improving the experience, reducing the carbon, it's all uh, mutual benefits. We have electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging stations, LEED certified buildings, and uh, we put them out there on the public lands uh, for demonstration purposes and to reduce our carbon impact, but also hoping that uh, when entities, whether they're businesses, whether they're civic organizations or individuals are considering what action you can take, that you can uh, come um, and see some of these opportunities and perhaps uh, use them as your uh, your climate action. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back to Deb Katani to field questions uh, from the media. Great, thank you, Secretary Dunn. Yes, now we'll open it up to questions from reporters. Please use the hand raising function at the bottom. Um, provide your name and the name of your outlet and then ask your questions. We'll try our best to answer questions in order. Hmm. Okay. Um, Can you hear me? Yes, Rachel, go oh. ahead. Hi, sorry. I think you were muted for a second. I'm not sure how I did that. Um, Rachel <laughs> McDonald at State Impact Pennsylvania. Um, I was curious if um, perhaps Patrick McDonald or Secretary McDonald could um, just outline what is most significantly different in this updated climate action plan from the last version. Sure. Um, so, so I think that there's uh, a couple things. One, um, uh, we have a little better information uh, that, that we're building upon in terms of, of the impact assessment that was released earlier. So uh, a little finer point on that. Um, I think there, there's a, a greater emphasis uh, this time on uh, items like uh, uh, the, the carbon sequestration, uh, you know, methane capture piece. One of the interesting things, and, and this is in, in talking with, with some of my other um, uh, colleagues in other states, is in, in a lot of cases, they have uh, one area that is overwhelmingly uh, the biggest driver of, of greenhouse gas sources uh, for them. For us, uh, when you look at the, the three big ones, uh, you know, electric generation, uh, transportation, and, and industrial, they're they're actually very very close uh, in terms of that overall percentage. So, um, you know, making sure that that we have an emphasis on all of those areas, uh, electric generation, transportation, and, and uh, industrial is is critical. Okay, and now we will take a question from Frank Coomer at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Let me, um, Frank, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, um, so the summary anyway uh, reports that the statewide average temperature has risen two degrees since 1900. Then it says uh, in a bolded point that it'd be an average of 5.9 degrees Fahrenheit hotter. Can you say what the base year of that is, 5.9 5, 5 degrees from now? 
or is that 5.9 degrees from uh, 1900? Uh, it, it's an additional uh, 5.9 degrees. From, from 20? Yes. 21? Okay. All right. Um, I'm trying to remember the base year if it's 2020. We, we can get you that specific answer, uh, what that year was, but I, I believe it might be uh, 2020 uh, is the base year for that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question from Paul Go at the Pittsburgh Business Times. Yeah, hi, Paul. thanks. It's Paul Goff from the Pittsburgh Business Times. Uh, uh, can you hear me okay? We can. Great, thank you, Commissioner, uh, Secretary. Uh, you mentioned that the climate plan envisions the transition of power generation to renewable and nuclear, and I'm looking at some of that uh, that data right now. I mean, what would that look like? Uh, you know, coal is obviously declining. Gas, though, is is uh, in a you know. I mean, they're seeing higher prices. The production is, if if not increasing, it's stable. How would that and uh, kind of what would that pathway look like? And what kind of time frame are you looking at? And how are you going to make that happen? Sure. So. Uh as I said before, you know, for some of this, we're looking at five years. For some, it's it's ten years and beyond. Uh, obviously, in, in implementing something like regional greenhouse gas initiative, um, it, it's something that starts to move us toward um, uh, less fossil fuels. Uh, but it but it's incremental. Um, it, it moves it in an in incremental path. Uh, similarly, if we did the advanced energy portfolio standard that would move us uh, in an incremental path. So I don't think any of this is, is you know, flipping a switch that, that would turn things off uh, uh, tomorrow, next year, uh, or, or this decade, but it's how do we put ourselves not just on a path to, to reduce fossil fuels, uh, but also, you know, frankly, take advantage of uh, the economic opportunity that we see in uh, uh, the renewable and, and clean energy space, energy efficiency, uh, wind and solar jobs, uh, you know, wind and solar being uh, two of the, the fastest growing jobs that, that we see in the Commonwealth. Okay, next question from Yanni Pashakis at the Central Penn Business Journal. Hello, everyone. Uh, how crucial is RGGI to this plan? How much do these actions rely on that RGGI money? Uh, so obviously, the 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 uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative revenue uh, is an important uh, factor, both in terms of the, the ability to reduce, but also the the uh, revenue it can provide uh, to to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and other pollutants. That said, it's not um, uh, that revenue isn't the thing we, we relied on in uh, this modeling or, or, or putting together the actions. Um, there's other things within this, uh, you know, building electrification, uh, building code changes, uh, the alternative energy portfolio standard uh, I mentioned earlier, the uh, low carbon fuel standard. Uh, as, as part of the plan that, that aren't about the revenue, but are about policy choices uh, in order to drive down emissions. So uh, Reggie certainly a, a large portion of it, uh, but it's it's not the only thing. One of the things we say in this space is is it's not a matter of, of one thing, five things. It's it's you know hundreds of, of actions and decisions, thousands of actions and decisions we're going to have to take. Okay, next question is from Joel Berg. Hi, thanks. Uh, the question I have is, I'm looking at the report on uh, Roman numeral page 18, and I'm trying to understand why the business as usual case shows pretty much a stop in the decline in emissions. So if you look at us from 2005 to the 2017, we're on this downward slope, right? And then if you continue that slope, we pretty much reach our target in 2050, but we have this base business as usual baseline that doesn't get us there. In some ways it shows us panning out and going back up in the 2040s. Uh, so I'm curious, what 
goes into that business as usual case that makes us makes you think we're not going to continue on the current trend downward, but are somehow going to stop and reverse course. Sure, thank you. And uh, it's really a couple things. Um, one is on the electricity side, a lot of that uh, reduction was driven by a changeover from uh, coal to natural gas. There's only so much of that replacement, uh, however, that you get. It's not a replacement that uh, continues to happen. The other is is within the vehicle uh, sector that that uh, continuing to see, um, uh, you know, as, as Secretary Gramian said, additional vehicle miles being traveled um, uh, and and potentially even some increases in that uh, sector. We're certainly seeing some changeover on the uh, uh, passenger vehicle side to electric vehicles, but um, it, it's not happening uh, quickly. I think we're at about 30,000 uh, registered vehicles of, of uh, over four, you know, well over four million vehicles uh, w within the Commonwealth. And none of that even speaks to to the medium and heavy duty uh, uh, vehicle sector, which, which we're, we're still kind of in the early stages of, of seeing change there. So it, it really is about- The recording uh, has stopped. It really is about the changes that um, uh, we've already seen and those not being able to be replicated, as well as uh, trends we're seeing in other sectors. Okay, a couple other questions here. Um, question from Laura Legier from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Thank you. Um, Two members of the Climate Change Advisory Committee um, who both work for fossil fuel firms um, called, um, referred to a fatal flaw in the plan, which is that um, it doesn't account for how some of these changes would affect surrounding states. Um, and it doesn't detail exactly how much, for example, cooler Pennsylvania would get um, from initiating these actions, essentially arguing that absent collective action and everyone else doing their part, this is a, a futile activity. Um, I'm just curious about your response to that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, my response on that is is relatively simple, and that is, um, you know, we, we as a state are uh, in the top five largest greenhouse gas emitters in the country. And while it's certainly true, Pennsylvania will not solve uh, uh, the climate change crisis on its own. The rest of the world will not solve it without us. And so we need to uh, 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 be active. We need to be uh, demonstrating leadership in this area. And in the same way that, that uh, we drove a lot of uh, industrial and energy production in, in our past, uh, we can drive uh, uh, renewable energy production and, and manufacturing going forward. So, um, yeah, we, the rest of the world uh, cannot do this without the Commonwealth. Patrick, if I add on to that, uh, the uh, carbon capture and storage uh, work that DC and ours do on through our geologic survey is done in conjunction with other uh, other state teachers of the basin studies on the potential for carbon capture and storage involves, in many cases, uh, other Appalachian Basin states that are energy producers. And so that's very much a collaborative effort. And I do think it, you know, and Patrick and Russell and I are in Chesapeake Bay meetings. Uh, Clyde is part of the Chesapeake Bay Initiative part of the Great Lakes Initiative, part of Delaware Initiative, every surrounding state is involved uh, in, in some manner. This is uh, an issue where everybody's uh, got to step up and do what it is in their jurisdiction that they can do. And, uh, you know, the Fortune 500 companies, you get on a web page for any Fortune 500 company, uh, my county, Cumberland County, just announced this climate plan. I mean, everyone's um, stepping up and uh, we just, we got to do with what's within our collective and individual abilities to uh, move the needle. Okay, we have a question from Pat Clunan from the Indiana Gazette. Will there be specifics for areas of the state, specific areas of the state that are reportedly of special interest as I've been told Indiana County is? 
Sure. So um, I think two things. Yeah, one, some of this relates to regional greenhouse gas initiative, and then some of it relates to uh, uh, climate action plan more broadly. I'd say, you know, as we look at um, uh, the, the Reggie revenues, certainly that is something that, that we've committed to uh, uh, spend uh, a fair bit of those dollars in, in accordance uh, with a lot of what's going on at, at federal level with it, you know, the Environmental Justice 40 initiative, uh, spending those dollars in environmental justice communities uh, uh, across the state. That isn't to say you need to be in an environmental justice community uh, to have the benefit, but there's certainly a, a thumb on the scale for, for a good portion of those dollars. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, we, we as, as uh, we look at the modeling on this, uh, we, we have the impacts uh, that we're going to see uh, across the Commonwealth in terms of things we're, we're already needing to start uh, adapting to and paying for. And those uh, in particular hit those communities. So making sure that, that we're spending dollars in those communities to, to encourage their resilience uh, is also critical. Okay, and it looks like we have one last question, um, again, from Rachel McDevitt at um, WITF State Impact. Rachel, um, Hi. My, that'll wrap it up for today. Um, I'm lowering your hand. Does that Thank unmute you? you? I'm a, I think I'm unmuted. Um, yep. Just, just the, with the Climate Action Plan, I mean, how much of it would be dependent, if we, if we were to do every item on it, how much is dependent on action from the legislature and how much is within the control of the executive branch and is already underway? Um, I don't have the, the tally, but but uh, uh, just as an example, again, you know, things like uh, advanced energy portfolio standard um, uh, is, is something that would require uh, legislative action. Obviously, we're, we're already pursuing regional greenhouse gas initiative. There are certainly things that, that um, uh, we can do, you know, so, uh, through some of the existing processes on codes and things like that. Uh, there's a, a lot of this uh, that, that obviously would, would uh, help to have uh, uh, legislation uh, Uh, really driving and, and making sure that precise answer in terms of uh, a percentage of, of actions or a percentage kind of subhead under under those actions. But uh, there's some of this that that is executive and then some of this that is um, uh, uh, would have some legislative requirements to it. Okay, that wraps up our questions. Thank you very much to our speakers, to media participants, and to those of you watching online. That concludes today's announcement. Thank you all. Thank you.